Try to remember back a decade or so ago in the last years of the Obama era. Can you recall what we were told was the single biggest threat to the American way of life, to our civil society, to our very existence? Here's a reminder. An attack on American soil. CIA Director John Brennan warning ISIS threat to the homeland tonight. ISIS threat, the message of terrorism from a new jihadi John. A new ISIS video threatens more attacks. A chilling new ISIS propaganda video threatening to attack New York City next. Yes, the threat of ISIS terrorists striking not just in Syria or Iraq, but here on our shores. And even though most experts told us not to panic, plenty of Americans did. And, of course, in the wake of two major mass shootings by attackers who did claim inspiration from ISIS in San Bernardino and Orlando, we were conditioned to focus on their foreign-sounding names and on their religion, and to downplay the fact that each of these terrorists were homegrown lone wolves living here in the U.S., and who actually had the most American thing of all, easy access to assault weapons and to handguns. The mass shootings continue today, but the main threat today is not from Muslim extremists, from ISIS folks. They are not the ones you see over and over using military-style weaponry to slaughter and terrorize Americans in their schools, in their supermarkets, in their malls. Last weekend, a gunman opened fire on Saturday at shoppers at an Outlook mall in Allen, Texas, with his AR-style rifle killing eight people, including a three-year-old child, and wounding seven more before being killed by police. At least half of the victims who died were members of the Asian community. And the shooter left behind a social media profile full of hate-filled rants against women and against black, Asian and Jewish people, a profile that praised Hitler and referenced neo-Nazi websites. What to make of all of this? Well, it doesn't take a detective. But if it helps, here's what one of the lead investigators said. We do know that he had neo-Nazi ideation. He had patches, he had tattoos. That's one thing we do know. Neo-Nazi ideation. And yet, if you had been following any right-wing media this week, you might have seen people saying that the killer couldn't possibly be a white supremacist because he was Latino. Um, hello, Enrico Tarrio, former leader of the Proud Boys. Hello, Nick Fuentes, Holocaust-denying leader of the Gruyper Army. Oh, and never mind the fact that the gunman shared memes about being a Latino white supremacist. Look, the fact is that experts report a rise in far-right extremism among Latinos and Hispanics, a majority of whom see themselves as white, fed by online misinformation and animus against other racial and religious groups. In fact, the ADL noted that the term on the tactical patch worn by the Allen, Texas gunman, RWDS, right, or Right Wing Death Squad, has its roots in Latin America. It describes Central and South American paramilitary groups in the 1970s and 80s that helped right wing governments target enemies on the left like the death squads of Chilean dictator Augusto Pinochet, who threw dissidents into the ocean from helicopters. These right-wing death squads have been commemorated on the shirts of the Trump-supporting, LGBTQ-hating Proud Boys on the streets of America, shirts that say, Pinochet did nothing wrong. For those of us who aren't willfully ignorant, it's clear what is happening here. A heavily armed, far-right fanatic with racist views committed a mass murder of Americans, including minority Americans, and not for the first time, or even the second or third. From Allen and El Paso to Charleston and Buffalo to Colorado Springs. According to the ADL, all the extremist-related murders in 2022, all of them were committed by right-wing extremists of various kinds. And of those, 84 percent were committed by white supremacists. They're even more dangerous than ISIS or Al-Qaeda when you look at the sheer numbers. And I haven't even included the eight people killed outside a migrant shelter in the Texas border city of Brownsville on Sunday by a driver who one witness told The Washington Post shouted, you're invading my property. Another witness told NBC News he shouted, effing migrants. I should point out, police say they could not validate these witness accounts and have only charged him with manslaughter, not murder. Look, what makes domestic terrorism like Allen, Texas, right now such a big threat is not just a death toll, but that it seems to have the support of a major American political party. As The New York Times writes, new spikes in anti-Semitic, anti-Asian, anti-LGBTQ violence in America have come at a moment when bellicose language and extreme ideas are increasingly common even among mainstream Republican officials. And experts on political violence say that the lines between right-wing extremists and ordinary right-wing figures have become hopelessly blurred. There's an understatement. 
Oh, and as if to prove them right, far-right Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene tweeted misinformation, racist misinformation about the massacre at the Outlet Mall. Quote, people were murdered yesterday in Allen, Texas, by this man who appears Hispanic with what looks like a gang tattoo on his hand. You're right about this much, Congresswoman. The killer was in a gang, your gang. The far-right white supremacist gang, a gang that is now very much part of the modern Republican Party, and that includes the likes of Green's pro-insurrection colleague, Arizona Congressman Paul Gosar, who traveled to the authoritarian nation of Hungary last week for CPAC, the far-right American conference that was held there, where Gosar and failed GOP gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake shared the stage with the leader of a far-right Austrian party founded by former Nazis. Yes, really. What we saw in Texas last weekend and the ongoing violence and massacres are not just random or isolated act, acts. They're not just about guns or access to guns. They're a product of hate and a far-right ideology of hate, an ideology that one of our two major parties is at best OK with and, at worst, encouraging. Earlier, I spoke to Kathleen Ballou, associate professor of history at Northwestern University and author of Bring the War Home, the White Power Movement and Paramilitary America. Kathleen, thank you for joining us on the show this week. On Monday, when reports were released about the Allen, Texas shooters' neo-Nazi online content and right-wing death squad patch, you tweeted, the fact that his name is Maurizio Garcia shouldn't confuse us. This was a white power shooting. Could you explain to our viewers what you were saying in that tweet for people who perhaps understandably have a more narrow understanding of what white supremacy is or who represents it? Absolutely. This is a confusing but critically important thing for us to understand, which is that whiteness in the United States is not the only definition of whiteness that um, exists for people in the world. Countries in Latin America, for instance, have their own ideas about whiteness themselves, socially and historically construed, that have to do with people who were enslaved, um, people who were native, people who were um, otherwise sort of seen as lower caste than the colonizing Spanish. Um, for all of those reasons, and because neo-Nazi ideology has now uh, traveled around the world, we can see roots of far-right ideology in many communities that in the United States we would not classify as white. It's also important to remember that white in the United States is a category that has been shifting dramatically over time. Yes. The, the yes. definition we're using now has only really been in common usage for about 100 years. And there are many groups of people in the United States who now would be classified as white, who would not meet that criteria in an earlier moment. It's a very good point. And of course, we shouldn't be surprised by this, because during the Trump years, since the Trump years, Hispanic Latino right-wing extremists have grown increasingly prominent. Of course, there are obvious people like white nationalist Nick Fuentes and Proud Boys leader Enrique Tarrio, but there are also other people that have gotten less attention. There was a Puerto Rican man who was arrested for beating up a black man during the Charlottesville attack, a Hispanic man in Midland, Texas, who attacked an Asian-American family because he believed Asians were to blame for the pandemic. Is there a reason, do you think, why we're seeing more and more of this kind of hatred extremism among quote, unquote, people of color in Latino and Hispanic communities? Yes, I think one reason is that people in the Latino community in the United States are articulating their own definitions of whiteness and making claims to white identity in some of these cases. The other reason is that the white power movement and militant right is a fundamentally opportunistic movement. And by that, I mean that it's yes. motivating ideology is that it is under attack, that it is facing an apocalyptic threat. Because of that, they have been incredibly versatile in recruiting anyone who could be recruited to the cause and have been very deliberate about bending the rules when it suits their own purposes. So one good example of this is in the late 1980s, um, they figured out how to incorporate racist skinheads, which added younger people, urban people, um, and kind of a violent strike force to the white power movement that, as it was. Um, they talked about this because if you think about, you know, a woman with a shaved head going topless, wearing heavy makeup, uh, listening to punk music, that's not the same cultural construction as a survivalist housewife um, wearing no makeup and a long dress and, and keeping separate, right? Um, so yeah. the mechanics of this movement is about fluidity and figuring out how to bring people in.
Kathleen, I want to make a bit of an analogy here and see if you agree. In Northern Ireland, one of the major political parties is called Sinn Féin. For a long time, they were considered to be the political wing for the Irish Republican Army, the IRA, a terrorist group. Is that where we're heading towards now with the Republican Party in America, dare I say? Is the GOP basically becoming the political arm of a domestic extremist movement that espouses violent and white supremacist ideologies? I mean, you have Donald Trump, Paul Gosar, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who have all spoken at conferences or had dinner with Nick Fuentes, the Holocaust denier. You have GOP members speaking just this past week in Hungary alongside the European far right. This is more than just an overlap or playing footsie, is it not? Yes. And... Um, I think another way to think about that same question is whether the organized militant right is acting as a strike force for the GOP. Um, I've seen evidence of both of those kinds of crossover, and certainly I think we can no longer say that there is a clear demarcation, a clear kind of uh, daylight between one and the other. These are incredibly interwoven at this point. Um, another good example of this is that um, one of the patches worn by the Allen, Texas shooter, the right wing death squad patch, um, has been repeatedly worn by other Proud Boys um, or by Proud Boys and others in that movement. I, we don't know yet whether the Allen, tax, Texas uh, shooter was involved in the Proud Boys per se, but it shows that there is a, a line we can draw from an act of what is meant to look like lone wolf violence, quote unquote, we shouldn't call it that because it is part of a movement. We can draw that line from Allen to the acquittal, uh, or excuse me, to the conviction last week of Tario and others on seditious conspiracy charges um, related to January 6th, and then draw the line from there to Trump's own handling of January 6th. Kathleen, quick last question. We've seen this attack on Saturday in Allen. We saw the attack in Brownsville. I've had discussions on this show before about whether we're heading towards a new civil war, God forbid. Would an American civil war in the 21st century look a bit like what we've seen at the last weekend? Not two armies on a battlefield, but this kind of low-level insurgent-type violence, domestic violence, shootings, bombings, drive-by attacks on soft targets. I think that's very likely. I think... Um... You know, I, I, warfare has changed so dramatically since the Civil War in the late uh, 1800s that I, there's there's simply no comparable. And we're no longer thinking about a regional division. We're thinking about yeah. divisions within our families, within our neighborhoods, about urban and ex-urban spaces. Um, and this is a movement, the white power movement and militant right, that has been studying, training in paramilitary camps, and learning how to conduct a counterinsurgency warfare operation at least since the late uh, 1970s. So there are decades of preparation aimed at this project. I think it's very, very concerning wow. that we're seeing wow. this escalation now. It's concerning. It's horrifying. It's tragic. Kathleen Ballou, thank you for your analysis tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's time for a segment we're calling Debunk That Tweet. And this week, it's from the owner of Twitter himself, the chief twit, the one and only Elon Musk. And there are so many tweets from him to choose from. See, in the wake of that deadly shooting in Allen, Texas, Musk has spent much of the past few days tweeting and amplifying right-wing conspiracy theories, suggesting the shooter was not a neo-Nazi and that the shooting itself was a psyop. And what you're seeing here doesn't come close to everything he's tweeted in the days since the massacre. I could stand here and debunk each and every one of these. But right now, I want to just focus on perhaps the most ridiculous thing he's ever said on this site, his site, which is a tweet in response to a separate killing of 30 years old Jordan Neely on a New York City subway last week. Neely, an unhoused man, was in distress when a 24-year-old ex-Marine put him in a fatal chokehold. That sparked an outcry throughout the city. Demonstrators took to the streets and subways to protest white vigilantism and the city's neglect of the unhoused. In response to these protests, Musk tweeted, why didn't they protest when the children were murdered at the Christian school? They are disingenuous. Seems like someone must have been asleep for much of late March and early April, perhaps at the wheel of their self-driving Tesla. Because the rest of us clearly remember the nationwide coverage of the mass protests against the Covenant school shooting in Nashville. The rest of us remember more than a 1,000 people, mostly young people, gathering at the Tennessee Capitol building on March the 30th, begging for an end to gun violence. The rest of us remember watching state representatives Justin Jones and Justin Pearson get expelled from the Tennessee House for participating in those protests. And the rest of us remember protesters gathered outside yelling, F you fascists, in response. 
So where was Elon Musk? How did the terminally online Twitter owner miss what was at the time perhaps the biggest news story in America? To suggest that nobody protested against gun violence in Tennessee? Well, that makes Musk the disingenuous one here. And it's funny, isn't it, that in the four days since that tweet, there's been no sign of his much-hyped community notes fact-check to correct Musk's misinformation. None whatsoever. That's why we did it instead.